Access your free language gifts of the month right now. Here's what you're getting this month. First, the writing a journal cheat sheet. With this cheat sheet, you'll be able to keep a diary in your target language and talk about your day. Inside, you'll find phrases for common daily activities from morning to night. Second, if you love travel, then you'll love our brand new travel words and phrases PDF ebook. Learn all the must know travel phrases with this ebook. Download it for free right now. Third, must know words and phrases for your resume. If you want to write your resume in your target language, then this next one minute lesson is for you. Fourth, the top 12 April Fool's phrases. Want to prank others and speak more of your target language? Then you'll want this April Fool's phrase list. Fifth, the must know vocab for doing laundry. If you need language for practical situations like doing laundry, then this one minute lesson is for you. You'll learn how to say washing machine, detergent, softener, and much more. Sixth, free audiobooks. Unlock our huge library of language learning audiobooks. Save them to your device and listen and learn. They're yours to keep forever. And finally, the deal of the month. If you want to finally master the language with lessons by real teachers and our complete language learning program, get 31% off premium or premium plus with the You Can Speak sale. So to get your gifts and language learning resources, click the link in the description below. Download them right now before they expire. Hi everyone, welcome to Kanji time. Let's review and do Kanji today. Ikimashou! Ganbaro! A A O. If you want to do the quiz first, please go to this time. This kanji means omen, trillion, sign, symptoms. The on reading is chō, like in sancho en, meaning three trillion yen. And the kun reading is kiza, as in haru no kizashi, meaning sign of spring. This kanji means baby, child, infant. The on reading is ji, ni, like in yōji, meaning infant, and shōnika, meaning pediatrics department. This kanji means party, faction, clique. The on reading is tō, like in yōtō, meaning ruling party, and yato meaning opposition party. Yoto to yato. This kanji means soldier, weapon, troops, army. The on reading is hei, as in kiheitai, meaning cavalry, and heishi, meaning soldier. This kanji means letter, volume, book, counter for books. The on reading is satsu, like in besatsu, meaning a separate volume, and sansatsu, meaning three books. Quiz time! Say the reading of the following kanji. Heishi Yato Besatsu Shonika Sanchoen. Now say the meaning of the following words. Haru no kizashi. Sign of spring. Yoji. Infant. Yoto. Ruling party. Kiheitai Cavalry Sansatsu Three books That's all for today. Thank you very much for watching. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about Japanese adverbs of frequency. Let's get started. Okay, first I want to review this grammar point. What is an adverb of frequency? Adverbs of frequency answer the question, how often? So when you ask something like, how often do you do 
something, some activity, and you respond with a word like always or sometimes or never, those words are adverbs of frequency. They tell us how often we do something. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about adverbs of frequency in Japanese. When we use adverbs of frequency in Japanese, we place these adverbs before the verb or before a verb phrase. So you'll notice throughout the example sentences that I prepared here, there are a couple of different places that you might hear the adverb uh, appearing. So I'll cover that in a bit. Also, I want to point out that you can use both polite verb forms and casual verb forms with these. So again, I'll show you uh, both forms in the example sentences, but just keep in mind that depending on the person that you're talking to and depending on your relationship, like for example, if you're close friends or maybe if you're roommates or if it's a working relationship, it will be up to you to choose whether you should use the polite form or whether you should use the casual form. So with that in mind, let's take a look at a few examples of this. First, this one. Uh, the first example here. So I've got everything laid out in this same pattern. We'll see romaji, and then we'll see hiragana, and then we'll see the full sentence using kanji as well. So the first sentence is this one. Watashi wa tokidoki terebi wo mimasu. So here, my adverb of frequency is tokidoki. Tokidoki. So this one means sometimes, sometimes. This sentence means I sometimes watch TV. Here you'll also notice that I have this beginning part, watashi wa, in parentheses. This is because when yourself, when you are the subject of the sentence or when the subject of the sentence is known, it's very common and very natural to just drop it in Japanese. For the purposes of this lesson, I've included it here so that you can see that I'm talking about myself. Um, but the key that I want to focus on throughout this lesson is this part right here, these adverbs of frequency. So, tokidoki, sometimes, terebi, so terebi means TV, television, o, and then mimas. So, here I'm using mimas, I'm using the polite form of the verb miru. But as I talked about earlier, you can use both the casual form and the polite form here. So, again, it's just up to the situation, that's up to you to determine. So that means that miru is also okay. Miru is the non-past casual form of the verb mimasu. So this is the non-past polite form, mimasu. So mimasu or miru. So miru mo okay. You can use both of these uh, to finish the sentence. So for example, tokidoki terebi wo miru is also totally correct. It again is just up to your relationship with the speaker. Another thing that I wanted to point out here um, is this. Uh, I know that I've written tokidoki in this way maybe a little bit differently than some of you perhaps have practiced before. This ki, uh, where maybe like this, this middle part that goes through uh, the top part of the ki, does not directly connect to the bottom part of this character. Um, so that's one thing that you might see in handwritten Japanese that's a little bit different uh, from what you've seen uh, when typing on your computer or like when using your smartphone too. So please note that this ki uh, is just a handwritten form of ki. So you might see both of those. It kind of depends on the person, but I feel like I see ki uh, written a lot this way. So I've chosen to include it in this way here. So again, this means I sometimes watch TV. I sometimes watch TV. So here, uh, I've got tokidoki before terebi o mimasu. Terebi o mimasu, so TV, and then mimasu. My verb comes here after my object marking particle o. So terebi o mimasu. I want to point out, though, that another thing you might hear sometimes is Terebi wo tokidoki mimasu. So sometimes you'll hear people using the frequency adverb directly before the verb as well, and that's fine. So watashi wa terebi wo tokidoki mimasu. So you might hear that as well. And of course, in very casual speech, like when someone just remembers something, as we do in English, you might just hear it added after the sentence. So for example, if you're having a conversation in English with a friend of yours, you might say something like, yeah, I watch TV, sometimes. You can do exactly the same thing in Japanese, like, oh yeah, terebi o mimasu, doki doki, that kind of thing. You can still do exactly the same thing. So just keep that in mind. Let's take a look at one more example, and then we'll move on to looking at the actual adverbs of frequency in more detail. This one, biru wo yoku nomu. Biru wo yoku nomu. So this sentence means I often drink beer. I often drink beer. So my frequency adverb here is yoku, yoku, and my verb is nomu. 
So as I said in the first example sentence, you can move that frequency adverb to another position in the sentence. So here I have biru, beer, biru, and you'll notice I've dropped the I. I haven't written the I, the watashi wa, part of the sentence here. So biru wo yoku nomu. So here, yoku, we often translate this as often in textbooks and stuff, but if you really think about how we use an expression like this in English, you could also understand it as like, all the time. So as an American English speaker, it's very natural for me to say like, oh yeah, I drink beer all the time. Something like that sounds a little more casual to me than I often drink beer. So keep that in mind. It doesn't have to be like a direct translation. Like yoku doesn't have to mean exactly often, but you can think of it as meaning all the time, especially in a situation like this, where the sentence ends in nomu. So nomu means to drink. And nomu is the casual non-past form. So nomu is correct. And as I mentioned before, we can use polite verb forms. The same is true with this example sentence. So nomu could also be nomimasu. So nomimasu mo ok. So keep this in mind. Either is fine. Again, if I'm talking about beer with someone, it's probably in a casual situation. And maybe, I don't know, I've just met this person in like a pub or a bar or something, and we're just chatting about drinking. And I might say something like, mm, yeah, biru o yoku nomu yo. So something like that sounds a little bit more casual than biru o yoku nomimasu. So it's up to you, again. Depends on how polite you want to sound. OK. so. I often drink beer, or you could understand this as like, I drink beer all the time as well. I think I just added a yo at the end of this sentence too. So you can add those kinds of things to give a little bit more emphasis as well. But again, this yoku comes before nomu in this case. You could also say yoku biru o nomu. That's also fine as well. So it just needs to come before the verb or kind of this verb phrase. So you can kind of think of the uh, object and the verb as connected in one like unit in that way. So it just needs to come before that. OK, so with this in mind, I want to take a look at a bunch of example sentences that use these adverbs of frequency. I've made a very, very rough scale from 0 to 100. And the scale, it's, it's not perfect, like 50 is not here, because there's a lot to talk about. But I want to show some example sentences and talk a little bit about um, some things for you to consider when you're practicing uh, your speaking in particular. So I want to start down here at the bottom of the scale, at zero. So the zero mark, uh, the zero point, is in English where we would say never, never. So in Japanese, we say zenzen, zenzen. So zenzen. This is the kanji for zenzen. You can look it up as well. Uh, so zenzen is used to mean never, like 0% of the time, something that you never do. And uh, we can also use zenzen for emphasis. We use it to mean like at all in English. So when we say like, I can't do that thing at all, or I don't do that thing at all, that's kind of the feeling we can communicate with zenzen. So let's take a look at a couple of example sentences that use this so that you can get an idea of it. First one is, 最近彼と全然会わない. So, 最近, recently, or these days, 最近彼と, so him, so some guy, person, some male person, to, so we use to when we're talking about meeting someone, doing something with someone, 彼と全然会わない, 全然会わない. So, this 全然, my never point, my never adverb of frequency, comes before my verb here. So, my verb here is ao. However, when we're using zen zen, and we'll also see the same rule with amari and metani, we cannot use a positive. We need to use the negative form of the verb here. Zen zen awanai. So literally, this sentence would mean, or this part of the sentence would mean, never don't meet, which if we directly translate it into English sounds like a double negative, but this is just the way it is in Japanese. So again, kare, or sorry, saikin, kare to zen zen awanai. So we kind of put this part, um, it, it's like a marker before the negative thing comes. So this is kind of telling us that there's something negative coming. So um, this is one pretty good example, pretty common example. Uh, so this sentence then means, uh, recently I haven't seen him. 
literally uh, it means I haven't met him or maybe recently uh, I never see him is perhaps a little bit more accurate here. It depends again a little bit on the context. Uh, but this is how we would use zen zen in a situation like this with uh, meeting someone. So let's take a look at one more example sentence that uses zen zen in this way. So this one is osake wa zen zen nomanai. Osake wa zen zen nomanai. So this means I can't drink alcohol at all or maybe I don't drink alcohol at all. So actually <clears throat> uh, I should say uh, I don't drink alcohol at all. I've used nomanai here. If I'd made the example sentence zen zen nomenai, so I meaning I can't drink alcohol, that would mean I can't drink alcohol at all. However, here I've made it nomanai, so nomanai is the casual non-past form of the verb to drink. So that means I'm not expressing possibility there. If I said nomenai, which means not able to drink, it would be I can't drink alcohol at all. Here, uh, I don't drink alcohol at all. So these are like important little distinctions to make. So for a translation of this sentence, uh, I don't drink alcohol at all, or I never drink alcohol. So again, let's break this down a bit. I have osake. So here I've attached uh, o to sake. So as maybe many of you know, sake means alcohol. It's not like a specific type of alcohol. It's alcohol. The word for alcohol in Japanese is sake. And we attach an honorific to sake. Uh, we use o in front of it. O sake, o sake. And then we mark it as our topic with wa. We follow this with zen zen. So again, zen zen is coming before the verb, in this case, nomanai, nomanai. Zen zen nomanai. I totally don't drink it at all. That's what this is saying. I never drink it. Osake wa zen zen nomanai. So please use zen zen before the negative form of your verb. I wanted to include a couple more examples then that use zen zen more as like an emphasis for at all. Uh, so let's take a look at these um, just to see, just to give you a couple more examples of the ways in which we use zen zen. So the first one here is chūgoku go, Chinese. Chūgoku go wa zenzen hanasemasen. Chūgoku go, Chinese. Chūgoku go wa zenzen hanasemasen. Hanasemasen. So hanasemasen, one, I'm using the polite form of the verb. So hanasemasen is showing me masen, the negative form as well. So polite negative form. I'm also using hanase. This is my potential form. So this is showing me potential and negative. So I'm expressing something that I cannot do. So, chūgoku go wa zenzen hanasemasen. So this sentence means I can't speak Chinese at all. I can't speak Chinese at all. So chūgoku go means Chinese. And then that's my topic marking particle, wa. Zenzen, so not at all, or it's coming before my negative verb. And then hanasemasen, so not able to speak. So put it all together, I can't speak Chinese at all. So I could remove zen zen from this sentence, but it would lose that emphasis of at all. Like I could say chūgoku go wa hanasemasen. That's fine too, I can't speak Chinese. But if you say zen zen hanasemasen, it's an emphasis thing. It's like I can't speak Chinese at all. That's the difference here by adding zen zen to this sentence. Let's look at one more example and then we'll move on to the next adverb of frequency. This one is piano wa muzukashikatta. So again, piano wa muzukashikatta. Zenzen dekinakatta. So here I've kind of got two parts. Uh, this is maybe similar to something you might hear in everyday speech. So not a perfect full sentence, but a couple of short ideas put together. So first is piano wa muzukashikatta. Muzukashikatta. So muzukashikatta is the past form of the word difficult. So muzukashi, maybe you know, means difficult or hard. So muzukashikatta means it was difficult. So piano was really difficult. Piano was difficult, maybe for me or something like that. Then the following sentence is zenzen dekinakatta. Zenzen dekinakatta. So again, we have the zenzen, meaning at all, our emphasis word, before dekinakatta. Dekinakatta. So again, we have this negative verb. In this case, I'm using the past form that is in casual. So dekiru means be able to do something, the verb dekiru. But here, I'm using dekinakatta, which means was not able to. So past casual, not able to do something, 
with this emphasis word zenzen. Zenzen deki nakatta. I couldn't play it at all, or I couldn't do it at all. So again, literally, like a literal translation of zenzen deki nakatta is like at all not able to do it. But if we think about it in context a little bit, here we're talking about playing an instrument, the piano. So you could think of this translation as something like, I totally couldn't play, or I couldn't play it at all. So think a little bit outside like the literal, like the direct translation of your verb, uh, and then it's going to sound a bit more natural when you think about the expression in English too. So this is how we use zen zen. Again, a key point with zen zen is that you're using it before the negative form of a verb. It can be the casual form or the polite form. Both are correct. So with that in mind, let's continue to the next one. The next one that I have here is a pair. So maybe uh, if you've studied Japanese in textbooks and online, you're probably familiar with this one, amari, amari. If you have, again, I suppose, studied a bit online, or maybe if you've been to Japan, or if you have some Japanese-speaking friends, uh, you might also know this one, amari, amari. They mean the same thing, but in speech, in everyday speech, amari tends to sound like amari, amari. So what's the difference? It might be hard to hear that, but amari, that's three syllables, that's three beats, amari. But amari, there's like this extra n sound there. So that's what it sounds like often in everyday speech. So we can think of these two, and actually the next one as well, mittani. We can think of these as meaning like hardly ever or rarely or seldom. So they're not zero, but they're expressing like a very low frequency of something. As we did with zen zen, we also need to use a verb in the negative form with these. So that means we're going to use nai or we're going to use masen. So this is for the casual form, nai. Uh, this would be the non-past form. And masen. This is the polite form, again, non-past form. So let's look at some example sentences and talk a little bit about how we might translate those into English. First one, let's take a look here. Uh, this one uses amari, amari. So eiga wa Amari minai. Eiga wa amari minai. So what does this sentence mean? First we have eiga. Eiga means movie. Eiga wa. So wa is my topic marking particle. Amari. Amari. So again, that's that feeling of like hardly ever or rarely or seldom. And then minai. Minai. So again, miru, which we saw earlier, miru or mimas means to see, to see or to watch. So here, we usually watch uh, movies. We usually say watch for movies. So I suppose you could say see a movie if you're talking about going to a movie theater. So we use the negative form here. Eiga wa amari minai. You could use, again, if you want to, this long form as well, the polite form. Eiga wa amari mimasen. Mimasen. So again, uh, for, well, for space reasons on the board, but also just in general, if you're speaking just with a friend, you're probably going to use this more casual form, but you can use mimasen as well too. Eiga wa amari minai. So please note, amari again comes directly before the verb. Amari minai. Amari minai. Eiga wa amari minai. Let's look at one more example. This one uses mettani, mettani. So you might not have seen mettani before. Uh, I don't feel that I see it so much or hear it so much compared to like amari or amari. Uh, mettani also means hardly ever. I think in the JLPT, it's about level N3, perhaps, for grammar. So mettani uh, is used to mean the same thing. We use it in the same way as we've just talked about with amari. So let's practice. This one, hon wa metta ni yomanai. Hon wa metta ni yomanai. So here again, metta ni, metta ni comes before yomanai. So this is the negative form of the verb yomu. Yomu means to read, yeah? So yomanai, negative. So metta ni, hardly ever don't read is what this means. It sounds again like a double negative, but this is just the way it is. So. I hardly ever read books. I hardly ever read books. Also a pronunciation point. One pronunciation point that I sometimes hear uh, learners uh, maybe have challenges with is with a word like this, home. home. So this is spelled in 
Roman letters, H-O-N. It looks like hon, hon, uh, but we do not say it like that, hon. So the, the n sound, the n at the end of this word is very soft. It's not like a hard English hon, hon. So try to make those n, those ending n sounds really, really soft, and then you'll be able to transition into that next wa much more smoothly. So like not hon, wa, metta ni yomanai, but hon, wa. So you can kind of hear how I do that, hon, wa. So the, it becomes like a nwa together. I'm putting those two sounds together, linking them. Hon, wa, metta ni yomanai. Also, another point here is this stop. So maybe it's a little bit difficult to see here because it's small, but in metta ni, there's this small tsu. So we know that when we see a small tsu, in our Japanese writing, it's showing us where we need to put those stops in words. When we look at the word in nomaji though, it looks like metani, metani, but we cannot pronounce it this way. It's totally incorrect. Metani, metani. So, hon wa metani yomanai, yomanai. So, make sure that this stop is also clearly pronounced. Metani, metani yomanai. Okay, so the big takeaway from this point here is to please make sure that you use the negative form with these adverbs of frequency. Okay, with that, let's continue on to the other side of the scale. The next one is tamani, tamani. So maybe you can see tamani also ends with this ni. So we saw it with metani, and now we're gonna see it with tamani, tamani. Um, you'll hear in everyday speech that people like to kind of extend sounds in this word. They'll say, tamani. This is something that I do. This adverb of frequency means like every once in a while or from time to time. So depending on how long you make that tama, that part, the ma sound, tamani, depending on how long that sound is, you can kind of emphasize uh, the frequency with which you do an action. So, tamani means like every once in a while. That's why I have it at maybe like the 40 or so mark on my scale here. So, different from the other ones that I've talked about in this lesson so far, uh, we do not need to use the negative form here. Here we use the positive form of a verb. We can use, again, uh, the casual form or the polite form. Both are fine. So, let's take a look at some example sentences. <clears throat> First one. Kare to tamani ao. Kare to tamani ao. So this sentence means, so him again, and I have to, to, so again, I'm marking uh, the person with whom I do something with to. Tamani, every once in a while, ow, meet, meet. So this means I see him every once in a while. I see him every once in a while. Kare to tamani ao. If you want to emphasize it, like I was talking about earlier, you can make this ma sound a bit longer. Kare to tamani ao. So that'll make it sound like it's very, very infrequent. That's kind of the vibe that you're giving off if you make that ma sound a bit longer. Kare to tamani ao. Again, you could use the uh, polite form here. Aimasu. Kare to tamani aimasu. So I see him every once in a while. It's just going to increase the level of politeness of your statement. One more example. <clears throat> Kohi o tamani nomu. Kohi o Tamani nomu. So we're seeing our friend nomu again here, drink, to drink. And in this case, I have kohi, coffee, coffee. So coffee, I have my object marking particle wo here, wo. Uh, and then I have tamani right before my verb. So we can use it uh, in exactly the same way as we talked about before here, just to make sure that your verb is positive. You should not be using the negative form of your verb. Also, one point I want to make, this wo, I have it here, and I think lots of textbooks uh, use O, or maybe they use W-O. Uh, the sound that sh you should be making is kind of, it's not like the, the strong English W sound. It's a much softer W sound. So, kōhi-o, it's kind of like you're sliding into it a little bit. Wo, kōhi-o, tamani nomu. So that was a little bit exaggerated. Uh, but try to think about this O sound, wo. So it's a very, very slight W sound at the beginning there, but uh, working on that will help you to sound a little more natural. Kōhi o tamani nomu, tamani nomu. And you'll hear too, like this ni kind of connects a little bit to the verb. So not kōhi o tamani nomu, but kōhi o tamani nomu. 
So they kind of connect. It's, it's kind of like everything flows nicely together there. So it's not so much um, of like this up and down that we have uh, in American English speech. Okay, so with that, let's carry on then to tokidoki, tokidoki. So tokidoki was in my example sentence in the beginning of the lesson. Tokidoki means sometimes, sometimes, or I guess you could also say like occasionally as well. So tokidoki, tokidoki, tokidoki gohan wo tsukuru, tokidoki gohan wo tsukuru. So sometimes gohan, food, so gohan, gohan wo tsukuru, tsukuru means to make. Tokidoki gohan wo tsukuru. So I sometimes make food, or I sometimes cook food. That's what this sentence means. Tokidoki gohan. Gohan. So gohan, again, I have an honorific here. Han is used before like just meals in general. So we don't have to be specific like breakfast or lunch or dinner. We just want to talk about like the act of cooking. We could use an expression like gohan wo tsukuru, like to make food or to cook food. Tokidoki gohan wo tsukuru. So again, I'm connecting this gohan to my uh, object marking particle here. Gohan wo tsukuru, tsukuru. And make sure that that uh, tsu sound at the beginning of tsukuru is really clear too. So not tsuru uh, and not tsukuru either. So another like kind of pronunciation challenge point that I hear from some people is they kind of make that tsu really, really strong. So it's not tsukuru. We don't have that really heavy like tsukuru sound when we uh, say this verb. We say tsukuru, tsukuru. So that U sound, that first U sound, or maybe the first U in tsu that we see on paper, this U, is really, really small. Tsu, tsu. So tsukuru, tsukuru. That's how it should sound. So tokidoki gohan wo tsukuru. Tokidoki gohan wo tsukuru. I sometimes make food. I sometimes cook food. Okay, one more example. Tokidoki jogging wo suru. Tokidoki jogging wo suru. So here I'm using a loan word, jogging, jogging, jogging. So jogging. Uh, I've written it here in both hiragana and katakana. Tokidoki jogging wo suru. So again, uh, I'm using tokidoki before this phrase, before this verb phrase. Jogging wo suru. Jogging wo suru means to go jogging or like to jog. So jogging wo suru. So in this case, again, I'm using jogging before wo. So that's my uh, activity. That's the thing that I'm marking as the object of my verb, which is suru here. So please be careful as well. Suru and tsukuru may sound a little bit similar when you're first getting started, but they're very different. So suru means like to do something generally. Tsukuru means to make, to make. Tsukuru, suru, tsukuru, suru. So a good listening point. Okay, so this is sometimes, sometimes. So I sometimes go jogging or I sometimes jog. We could understand those uh, as the translations for this example sentence. Okay, carrying on, two more to go. The next one is yoku, yoku. So I used yoku in this example sentence up here. Biro yoku nomu. So yoku means like often, as we talked about earlier. Often or all the time, frequently, something that we do regularly, yoku. So let's look at some more examples that use yoku. Also, uh, a pronunciation point, when you say yoku, it shouldn't be yoku or like yoku, something like that. Yoku, yoku. So let's take a look at how we put this word in sentences then. Uh, down here, because I was running out of space. First one, smaho yoku tsukau yo. Smaho yoku tsukau yo. So this is maybe a little bit confusing at first. Sumaho, what is a sumaho? Sumaho o. So I know that this is maybe like a noun. I can probably guess it's a noun because it comes before this direct object marker, yeah? And then I have yoku, my adverb of frequency, plus my verb and then an emphasis marker, yo. So sumaho is the shortened word or like the way that uh, we say smartphone in Japanese. So sumatohon, I guess, is how you would say it uh, as a long word. But that's quite a long word, sumatohon. And we say it a lot. So this gets abbreviated. This becomes shortened to sumaho, sumaho, sumaho. Yoku tsukau yo. Yoku tsukau yo. So yoku, often. Tsukau, tsukau. So again, we have that tsukau. Tsukau. So it starts with that tsu sound, just like we talked about with tsukuru. So again, this tsu sound, the u sound in that tsu, should be really, really short. So not tsukau. I hear lots of learners say that when they're beginning. Not tsukau. 
but like skull, skull. So every syllable is there. Yo good skull yo, yo good skull yo. And I'm adding this emphasis, yo, yo. So it's like a spoken exclamation point. Mm. So smaho, yo good skull yo. Another example. Kanojo wa yoku undo suru. Kanojo wa yoku undo suru. So here, kanojo. So her, she. Wa. So she's my topic. Yoku, adverb of frequency, meaning often, regularly, all the time. Undo. Undo means exercise. Undo o suru. So undo o suru is like we can think of as another kind of unit, a verb unit, meaning to exercise, to do exercise. So this sentence we could understand as meaning she often exercises or she exercises all the time. Kanojo wa yoku undo suru yo. I could add maybe like emphasis there if I want to uh, like emphasize that someone is an athlete. So again, it's up to you if you want to add like those little yos or nes or whatever at the end of your sentence. Kanojo wa yoku undo suru. So here too, you'll notice that before my, uh, before my particle here, o, I have this o sound, undo, and that undo has that long o sound that's really tough. So to pronounce that, and then it just connects to the wo, like the direct object marking particle there. Undo o suru. So you don't need to say undo o suru. You can connect everything the same way that we would connect similar sounds kind of in English too. So undo o suru. Um, so that's another point that maybe you can practice. It doesn't, it shouldn't all be like a long undo suru. <laughs> you need to be able to kind of mark with your voice where that particle is. So undo suru. It kind of goes up undo suru. So anyone who's listening can figure out like where that word ends, undo, and where the marker comes in, uh, the direct object marker comes in, and then we kind of go back down to that suru, undo suru. So this means uh, she often exercises, so she exercises all the time. All right, let's go on to our very last one for this lesson. The last one is at the 100 mark of the scale, itsumo. Itsumo, itsumo means always, always. So we talk about the things that we always do. So things that are part of our everyday schedule that we do every day or every hour, every week, whatever. We use itsumo to describe that, itsumo. So let's look at some examples. First one, neru mae ni itsumo kao arao. Neru mae ni itsumo kao arao. So neru mae ni, neru mae ni, let's break this down. Neru mae ni. So neru means to sleep. Mae ni means before. So sleep before, it doesn't sound like so natural when I translate directly into English, but this means before sleeping or before I go to sleep. Neru mae ni itsumo kao o arao. Kao means face. Arao means wash. So I have itsumo before this action. Kao o arao. Itsumo kao arao. So Itsumo means always. I always wash my face before I go to sleep. I always wash my face before I go to sleep. Always face, marked here by my wo, my direct object particle, verb, arao. So before I go to sleep, I always wash my face is what this means. One more example. Asa, itsumo ha o migaku. Asa, itsumo ha o migaku. Asa means morning. Itsumo, always. Ha, teeth. O, migaku. So literally, polish, but here, brush. So, asa, itsumo, ha o, migaku. So, I always brush my teeth in the morning. So, asa, morning. Itsumo, ha o, migaku. So, again, itsumo is coming before this kind of like verb phrase, this verb unit. Mm. So, itsumo, ha o, migaku. So, this is how we use itsumo. Again, we use itsumo. Yoku, tokidoki, and tamani with the positive forms of verbs. We use these, zenzen, amari, amari, and metani with the negative forms. Mm. So please keep this in mind as you're practicing uh, your speaking and your writing with these adverbs of frequency. So uh, this is a really good one, I think, uh, for you to practice. You can practice this with your writing uh, a lot to talk about uh, how often you do certain activities. So this is a really, really great one uh, that you can use uh, for just some quick writing practice at home. 
So I hope that this lesson was helpful for you. Of course, if you have any questions or comments, or if you want to practice making some example sentences, please feel free to do so in the comment section of this video. If you like this lesson, please, please, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to our channel if you have not already. And check us out at JapanesePod101.com for some other things that can help you with your Japanese studies. Thanks very much for watching this lesson, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Ten words you should know for talking about music. Let's go. Ikuze, yeah. Ongaku. Ongaku. Music. Ongaku. Music. Donna ongaku o kikimaska? Donna ongaku o kikimaska? What kind of music do you listen to? Fudan ongaku o kikimaska? Do you usually listen to music? Gaki. Gaki. Musical instrument. Gaki. Musical instrument. Anata wa gaki o ensou shimasu ka? Anata wa gaki o ensou shimasu ka? Do you play a musical instrument? Piano. Guitar. Sax. Trumpet. Trumpet ko dake. Drum. Bass. Opera. 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 Isho jan, nihon goto. Opera. Opera. Opera wa 16 seki, Italia de hajimata. Opera wa 16 seki, Italia de hajimata. Opera began in Italy in the 16th century. Opera no yume na kyoku wa nani ga atta ka na? Opera, opera, ah. Jazz, 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 jazz. America no New Orleans wa jazz de yume desu. America no New Orleans wa jazz de yume desu. New Orleans in the United States is famous for jazz. In jazz, seven short days. You change your life. I change my life. Ongaku ka. Ongaku ka. Musician. Ongaku ka. Musician. Watashi wa ongaku ka desu. Watashi wa ongaku ka desu. I am a musician. Watashi wa ongaku ka desu. <laughs> Popus. Popus. Pop music. Popus. Pop music. Nihon no popus wa J-pop toshite shirare teiru. Nihon no popus wa J-pop toshite shirare teiru. Japanese pop music is known as J-pop. J-pop. Kankoku no popus wa K-pop. J-pop, K-pop. Kashu. Kashu. Singer. Kashu. Singer. Anata no skina kashu wa dare desu ka? Anata no skina kashu wa dare desu ka? Who is your favorite singer? Bando. Bando. Band. Bando. Band. Kore wa nan toyu bando desu ka? Kore wa nan toyu bando desu ka? What is the name of this band? Tatoeba AKB48 toka, so you oki group, de minaga odotari, utatari steiru. Group wa bando to yori mo idol group, de yobaremas. Classic ongaku. Classic ongaku. Classical music. Classic ongaku. Classical music. Classic ongaku o kikuto, kibun ga ochitsuku. Classic ongaku o kikuto, kibun ga ochitsuku. I feel relaxed when I listen to classical music. Classic ongaku. Tama ni wa kikuto i kamo shene nai. Nanka, sagyo o shite ruto kito ka, like when you working or when you just want to relax. It's good music. Rap. Rap. Rap music. Rap. 
rap music. ラップは早すぎて私はうまく歌えません。ラップは早すぎて私はうまく歌えません。Rap music is too fast. I can't sing very well. If you've studied your target language, but you can barely understand native speakers, you might be doing something wrong. You know the vocabulary and grammar they're using, but for some reason, when they speak at a faster speed, you can't keep track of what's going on. Why is this happening? Have you spent all this time learning in vain? This is a common issue that all language learners face at some point or another. The truth is, it's actually a good problem to have because only students with a higher level of skill will experience it. When you know a lot of the language but have trouble understanding native speakers, the problem is almost always with your listening skills. Learning what words mean and practicing how to use them in a sentence are both invaluable skills to develop. But people often forget that in addition to speaking, writing, and reading, we have to develop our listening skills in a foreign language as well. In this video, we'll look at three practical ways to improve your listening skills. Number one, practice active listening. One of the best ways to practice listening is to, well, listen to your target language. But this doesn't mean putting on some music and listening to it in the background as you do other things. You need to practice active listening. Get your hands on a recording of spoken language. You can use a movie, news broadcast, or a podcast. You can even try subscribing to a YouTube channel. Listen to a segment of the audio and do your best to write down what you hear. After a couple tries at this, go back and double check what you wrote against the script of what was actually said. If you're watching a movie, you can double check yourself by turning on the subtitles. Our language learning program is one of the best tools for developing your listening skills. You can listen to the conversation in a lesson and then check it back against the lesson transcripts. This is simple, easy, and you can be sure that the transcripts are correct. Number two, practice pronunciation. Any problems you have pronouncing new words correctly will be reflected back in your listening skills. It's hard for your brain to decipher and remember a sound, be it a letter or a word, that you don't know how to make yourself. A good accent will give you the ability to hear and pick out the otherwise unnatural new sounds. To develop your accent, focus on any sounds or letters that feel difficult or unnatural for you. Once you get more comfortable with the basic sounds, start to combine them using words and whole sentences. Listen to native speakers as much as possible and take note of how words and sounds can blend, morph, or get dropped in rapid speech. Do your best to listen to this phenomenon and imitate what you hear. Focus more on how the syllables are said together rather than simply saying the words next to each other. There is often a significant difference between how words are said individually and how they are said when spoken together in a rapid fire sentence. This is a big part of the reason language learners can know a lot of vocabulary and grammar but still not understand native speakers. Our playback feature is great for pronunciation practice. You can play back the podcast itself or listen to words individually. You can even listen back at a slower speed if you're having trouble catching the correct pronunciation at native speaker speed. Number three, make listening part of your routine. Now that you've started practicing active listening and pronunciation, make it a part of your regular learning. A lot a specific amount of time for each of your listening activities. For example, you might practice 10 minutes of active listening, followed by 10 minutes of practicing vowels, and then 10 minutes of imitation practice with a podcast. Now, you don't have to use this schedule exactly. Tailor it to your own needs and availability. The point is that you should make a conscious and decisive effort to practice your listening skills on a regular basis. It could be 30 minutes a day, or it might be 10. What matters most is that you practice consistently. These three tips will help you close any gap that might exist between your knowledge of your target language and your listening abilities. Understanding native speakers may seem daunting at first, but with a little time and perseverance, you will see your skills improve. Few things are more discouraging than putting in the work and effort to learn a foreign language, only to not use it for a while and forget a large part of what you studied. Once you have a good handle on a language, it's not hard to practice it so that it stays in the forefront of your mind. In this video, we'll take a look at five practical ways you can make your target language a part of your daily life so that you don't forget it. Number one, use language exchanges. The idea behind a language exchange is that you find someone who fluently speaks your target language and is also interested in learning your native language. During the exchange, you spend half the time speaking in the language you're learning and the other half in the language they're learning. 
This kind of exchange is a great way to practice your speaking skills and cement the material you've learned into your brain. One great thing about practicing through a language exchange is that your language partner is a fellow language learner. They will be able to sympathize with your struggles and even give you some insightful tips from their own personal experience. Most major cities will have at least one meetup or language club where you can practice languages with people from around the world. But sometimes it can be hard to find people who speak the language you're learning. If you can't find a local exchange or if there are no native speakers in your city, you can connect with native speakers through online language exchanges. There are numerous free sites that allow you to search for users based on country and language and have a text, audio, or video practice session. Number two, immerse yourself digitally. Most phones, laptops, and apps will allow you to change the language of their interface. Why not change it to your target language? This simple change may seem small, but it can actually be an effective way to reinforce your use of the language. Your language skills are like a muscle. If you use them on a regular basis, then your skill in the language will be in good shape. The more you use your language skills, the easier it will be to remember things. However, if you go for long stretches without using the language, then you might have a problem. Those linguistic muscles will start to get weak before too long, and you'll notice a drop in your language ability. Simply changing the language on your electronic devices won't equate to any heavy lifting in a foreign language, but it could be comparable to a warm-up or a quick workout. Remember that you probably use electronic devices every day. If you can use at least some of that time thinking in your target language while using them each week, that adds up to a huge amount of time and can keep your knowledge fresh. Number three, teach others a language. You don't have to be an expert in a new language to lend a hand to another language learner. Helping a beginner through the language will not only make you feel good about helping someone out, it will also help you use the language and keep your skills sharp. Remember those language exchanges we talked about? Well, what if you looked for other learners so that you could help them in the language? Don't worry if you don't feel qualified to teach the language. They're not looking to get their PhD in linguistics. Most likely, a new learner would appreciate someone who's been down the road before, someone to show them some common pitfalls and shortcuts. Have you ever been a complete newbie in something and been graciously helped by someone with more experience? Pay it forward and be that expert to someone else. Your language muscles will thank you for it. Number four, keep a journal or blog. Writing out your thoughts in a foreign language is one of the best ways to sharpen your skills. It forces you to take time to construct sentences and it will reveal your weak points very quickly. Journaling is also one of the easiest and cheapest ways to practice. All you need is a pen and a notebook. If you're not the journaling type, don't worry. You don't have to write an autobiography. Simply recounting your day or describing an experience will be enough to get your language juices flowing. The entries can be long, but they don't have to be. This exercise is flexible and can take any shape you want. Try writing short daily entries. You can even post them online for native speakers to correct. This way, you can hold yourself accountable and write regularly. There are several free sites that allow you to post an entry and have it reviewed by native speakers. Number five, entertain yourself in the language. Books, movies, YouTube videos, language learning websites, music, the list goes on. There's an endless supply of media out there, so you're likely to find something that interests you in your target language. Whether you love sports, rock music, or sewing, you're sure to find something to entertain you in your target language. Learning a language is hard, but remembering it doesn't have to be. These ideas are here to help jumpstart your brain. These aren't the only ways to practice your target language either. Do your best to use the language on a daily basis and make it a part of your everyday life. Remember, all languages aren't just spoken, they're lived. The fear of making mistakes is one of the biggest roadblocks to language learning. Out of all the discomforts that come with learning a foreign language, nothing looms quite as daunting in the mind of a beginner. It's almost as if we're hardwired to want perfection when we speak. However, the reality is that mistakes are unavoidable. In fact, mistakes are an integral part of the learning process. Think of small children who are just starting to learn language. They mispronounce words, they use words incorrectly, and their grammar isn't very good. Sometimes they even make up their own words. Research shows that this is all a natural part of the process. If making mistakes made up such a huge part of learning our native language, why do you expect it to be any different when learning a foreign one? In this video, we'll talk about six ways you can benefit from your mistakes while learning language. Number one, be humble. There's no room for pride when you're learning a new language. 
If you're a beginner, native speakers will likely be very accommodating with your mistakes and slower reaction times during conversations. There's no reason to be embarrassed. Remember that it's a sign of respect to learn another person's language. No one expects you to speak flawlessly right from the start. No one's going to hold your mistakes against you, so make sure you don't either. Number two, don't play the comparison game. Whether it's a native speaker or another person learning the language, don't make the mistake of comparing your progress to someone else's. No doubt, at the beginning, there will be times when it feels like everyone is speaking perfectly and you're left in the dust. But try not to get discouraged. It's your race to run, not theirs. Everyone has their own story, their own reason, and their own method for learning. Comparing your progress to someone else's progress is like comparing apples and oranges. It's easy to stress out when someone speaks perfectly while you're struggling to make the most basic sentences. But don't forget that while you can easily see someone else's success, you're much less likely to see the hard work that got them there. Every speaker you meet had to learn the language at some point. Whether it was as a child or as an adult, they too had to wade through their mistakes before they could speak fluently. Number three, get feedback on your mistakes. Anytime you write or speak your target language, try to get feedback from someone who speaks that language. You can make mistakes day and night, but if they're never corrected, they do you no good. If you can't learn from a mistake, or if you don't know that it's a mistake, it won't help you. Many in the language learning community hold that feedback is an integral part of the language acquisition process. Encourage friends and language partners to correct your speaking anytime, all the time. Worst case scenario, you'll make a mistake 100 times and get corrected 100 times. It might seem frustrating, but it's all worth it on the 101st time when you finally remember your mistake and start speaking correctly. Some mistakes will be easy to fix and you'll adjust your speaking right away. Others might take a while. Speaking a foreign language is a little bit like juggling. There are a lot of moving pieces you have to keep in place. Whether it's pronunciation, grammar, or vocabulary, getting feedback on your effort will help refine your language skills until you feel comfortable in the language. Number four, listen to your brain. After all the practice and feedback, eventually you'll start to notice that certain words come to mind without having to think about them. Instead of having to scan your brain for the latest new vocabulary word, you begin to instinctively come up with a word for a given sentence. Don't hesitate to blurt this word out. Sometimes it will be completely wrong. Other times it will be dead on. When words start coming to mind instinctively, that means your brain is starting to get more and more used to using a new language. The incorrect words are sort of like growing pains. You'll have them for a little while, but over time you'll encounter them less and less until all of your instinctual words are correct. So don't let the fear of making a mistake short circuit your brain's natural learning process. Go with whatever word your brain gives you. Number five, never take the easy way out. If there are two ways to say what you wanna say in your target language, one you know and are comfortable with, and the other you're not sure of, use the one you're least comfortable with. Purposely choose subjects and sentence constructions that are difficult for you. Don't get complacent and fall into the trap of using the same phrase over and over again, or having the same type of conversation with a language partner. You always want to push your language skill boundaries to stretch them even further. Number six, enjoy the language for its own sake. Small children not only make a ton of mistakes when they learn to speak, they also have a ton of fun. To them, life and language are both giant mysterious adventures. They aren't worried about making progress, impressing people, or speaking perfectly. Take a note from their playbook. Enjoy the language as you learn it. Let your focus be on the beauty and magic of the language. Savor the times you get to use it. If you loosen up and enjoy the ride, you'll learn much faster. Mistakes are a powerful and indispensable part of learning a language. We hope this video inspires you to stop being afraid of them and start embracing them. Are you improving? How to assess your language skills? Have you ever wondered, am I actually getting better with my target language? If you want to know how to check and see if you've improved or not, then keep watching. Today you'll learn why assessment can mean the difference between fluency and failure, how to assess your language skills, even if you're learning on your own, and much more. But first, listen up. Here are this month's new lessons and resources. First, the writing a journal cheat sheet. With this cheat sheet, you'll be able to keep a diary in your target language and talk about your day. Inside, you'll find phrases for common daily activities from morning to night. Second, if you love travel, then you'll love our brand new Travel Words and Phrases PDF ebook. Learn all the must-know travel phrases. Download it for free right now. 
Third, must know words and phrases for your resume. If you want to write your resume in your target language, then this next one minute lesson is for you. Fourth, the top 12 April Fools phrases. Want to prank others and speak more of your target language? Then you'll want this April Fools phrase list. Fifth, must know vocab for doing laundry. If you need language for practical situations like doing laundry, then this one minute lesson is for you. You'll learn how to say washing machine, detergent, softener, and much more. To get your free resources, click the link in the description below right now. They're yours to keep forever. Okay, let's jump into today's topic. Are you improving? How to assess your language skills. So, have you ever wondered, am I actually improving with my target language? Feeling like you're not improving can hurt your motivation. On the flip side, if you notice yourself understanding more of the language than before, you can feel good, and that can fuel your motivation to keep going. But it's not easy to spot your improvement. It's tricky with language. It's not like going to the gym, where you can see your muscles in the mirror. This is where assessment comes in. What's assessment? The easiest example of assessment is a test. If you go to a language class, you'll get a test on the first day. The goal of the assessment test is to understand where your language level is. And any test after that is a way to see how much you've improved. This is ongoing assessment. So assessment is checking where you are now and how far you've come with your language learning. Assessment lets you see where you've improved and helps you find what you need to work on. If you're serious about learning a language, it's one of the best things you can do to stay on track, stay motivated, correct your mistakes, and reach fluency. But assessing yourself is also hard if you're learning on your own. So what can you do? Here's how you can assess your language skills, whether you're learning with our program or not. Number one, if you're a Premium Plus user, retake the assessment test. Technically, you can only take this once, but if you get in touch with our support team, we'll give you the link. If you're using any other resource, find a way to test yourself. Look for practice tests, apply for a proficiency test, take online quizzes, anything that forces you to test your language skills. Number two, revisit old lessons. An easier way to self-assess your language level is to revisit old lessons. You can do this with any program you're learning with. If you've truly made progress, then you should be able to understand the lesson dialogues with no problem. If not, then you know that you need to review them some more. Number three, try harder lessons. Also something you can do with any language resource. If you're using our program, try lessons from a higher level. If you're a lower intermediate, try upper intermediate lessons. If you don't understand anything, that's fine. But if you do, then that's a good sign that you've improved and are ready for harder lessons. Number four, for reading, check out our extensive reading books. These are available for all levels, from absolute beginner to advanced. You can reread old ones or try harder ones to see where your current level is. You'll find these books in our lesson library. This will help you assess your reading and comprehension skills. Number five, for speaking, use our voice recording tool. If you can easily repeat the lines from the conversation, that's a good sign. Or if you're using another program, try to shadow the provided conversations. If you can do it without a problem, then you've made progress and are ready to go to the next level. Number six, for writing, try and copy out our lesson dialogue by hand. The point here is to see if you can write smoothly or not as a way of assessing your writing. You can also do this with any textbook. You can also take a picture of your writing and send it to your Premium Plus teacher for feedback. Number seven, use our Premium Plus assignments. If you're a Premium Plus member, you can ask your teacher to send you weekly assignments based on your needs, whether for reading, writing, speaking, or listening. And they'll provide you feedback so you can see where you are with each skill. So to recap, one, take our assessment test. Two, revisit old lessons. Three, try harder lessons. Four, use our extensive reading books for reading. Five, use our voice recording tool. Six, write out dialogues by hand. And seven, take advantage of our assignments. Remember, the point of assessment is not to pass or fail, but to see where you've improved and where you need to work. So thank you for watching this episode of Monthly Review. Great work. Here's a reward. Speed up your language learning with our PDF lessons. Get all of our best PDF cheat sheets and eBooks for free. Just click the link in the description.